The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Kel Chaco Toothpaste. Kel Chaco. Happy Smile. Enterprise Life. Enterprise. Your Advantage. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television here on The Point of View on City TV. We pick the right topics, get the right guests, delve into the right issues with relevant questions. And tonight we're focusing on the coup d'etat in Guinea. It's a big story and we're get, delving into the various angles of it. I'll be speaking to uh, some very interesting people and I'll be taking your comments as well. So stay tuned as we have a chat about what has happened in Guinea what it means for the West African sub-region, where it leaves ECOWAS, and whether in Ghana we should be getting worried about the growing insecurity within the West African sub-region. Stay with us. Come back to the show. So tonight we're asking what happened in Guinea. What does it mean for the West African sub-region? Where does that leave ECOWAS? And what's the latest situation? So I was speaking to a couple of people. Uh, Ambassador D.K. Osei is one of Ghana's most respected diplomats. And he'll be joining me to share his insights. He served in Guinea between 1992 and 96. He also served in various parts of Africa. Another interesting place he served was in Conakry. He's my main guest for the show. I'll also be speaking to Dr. Abdel Jalil Ateku, who has written extensively on Africa with some very interesting insights on term limits and what that means. Don't forget that the man who has been overthrown attempted to extend his term. Indeed, he did succeed. He went for a third term, although the original constitution gave him two terms. And some people think that was part of the reasons for the coup. I'll also give you a quick overview of Guinea, why it's an important country, what the Ghana Guinea Mali Union meant, his relationship with Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and of course Modibo Keita, why Guinea in 1958 voted to be independent from France and not an autonomous state within the French arrangement, and all of that, what all of these mean. So I have quite a number of people to talk to, but I want us to start with um, a, an official from the Information Ministry of Guinea. We will not put his picture on the TV for security reasons, but we, we know he's called Thieno Diallo. He's joining us to give us quickly what's happening. This coup happened on Sunday. This is Monday evening. Thieno, good evening. Thanks for joining us. Okay, good evening. Thank you. What is the situation now in Guinea? Oh, as you hear, as you were going to record that uh, uh, coup d'etat was yesterday, 5th of September 2021. Uh, by <coughs> well, sorry, by the colonel uh, uh, Jumbuya. Mari Jumbuya is a, is a colonel of uh, the special forces made by, created by Alpha Conde, the former president, armed by Alpha Conde, the former president, and special forces made by the, that, um, Alpha Conde. So, he, he came from his own tribe, in the Malingo, so took the power yesterday, on 5th September 2001. That happened yesterday. From yesterday to today, uh, the colonel of Dunguya is really determined to put in order in our administration, to put in line justice in Guinea, because the country really was going really democratically badly. Okay. Is this a popular coup? Are people happy with what has happened? Yes, of course. <clears throat> yes, of course. People are really happy because it, uh, uh, you can you can feel uh, all people are that the people are out from 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 downtown. Where is the the, 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 the president of Nigeria? From there, after taking making the foot of the coup d'état, after making the official announcement, from there, downtown, we are the call anti. From there, all to the review 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 where they call the IRTC. Everybody was out. Everybody was really clapping, singing, really assisting, escorting this uh, Colonel Dumbuya with his forces. 
Okay. What will happen to former President Conde? What will happen to him? Hello? What will happen to President Conde? Hello, sorry? It's off. I'm asking you what will happen to President Conde? Will, 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 will he be... Oh, for the moment, when, when, uh, for the moment, uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel, uh, Colonel Mamadi Kondi has said that President, uh, Alpha, uh, Alpha, Alpha, President Alpha Kondi is doing fine. He is in the test area. He has doctor said that everything is going good with uh, the former President Alpha Kondi. And today, uh, today, uh, today, this is September, Has it has he announced when he will hold elections? Not yet, but he said that in the next coming days there will there will be dialogue will be be in place, and uh, yeah, we, we we do believe that in the coming days uh, the announcement announcement we are new to take place. Finally, you work with the Ministry of Information. Are you concerned about your own safety? We are really uh, anxious about our safety because the former government, uh, the former government of, 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 of the former president Alpha Conde, uh, uh, there is no independent of speech. Can you, uh, no independent of speech. No independent of information. All this, uh, all this, all this uh, cycle to the to, to the to, 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 to the government. All is supposed to be it's really something which is not which is new. Now uh, we are going to we are going to get the zeal, and we are going to see that we are going to make an with some communications with other countries or with other institutions. It's something which is fair. But for the moment, we are going to be careful to know uh, to do not to be in some problems in the country. That's why we are going to be careful of our communications. Uh, but we need also to to, to to show the rest of Africa, the rest of world. I said that, as he said, one most important thing, he said that in the, one of his, one of his speech, the colonel, the colonel Dumbuya, he said that we are going to make a model like Jerry Rosalind of Ghana. That is very important. He said. So, so, it will be a model. so he, he mentioned, Jerry, he mentioned Jerry Rawlings of Ghana. So he, he obviously admires Jerry Rawlings. Yes, that's right. Yes, in one of his speeches, yes, uh, <clears throat> Uh, said that they will, they will they will be something which is great, like a mother of Jerry Rollins in Guinea, and that all Guinea will they get a, 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 a man, a soldier that will be a mother like Jerry Rollins in Guinea to put a real democratic system in the country, to have former presidents in our country, one, two, three, or several former presidents in our country. Thank you for talking to us. Stay safe. Okay, thank you, very, thank you very much. Tiano Suleiman Diallo is, um, works with the Information Ministry, and he gave us a quick overview. We apologize for the quality of the line. As you can imagine, uh, getting through to calls 
with calls to a place like Guinea at this time may not be the best, but we thank you for enduring that. So what do we know about Guinea? Before I talk to my guests, just a few quick uh, slides to show you a few things. So we know Guinea got independence in 1958, and this was after a referendum in September of that year when French President Charles de Gaulle gave all the French colonies a chance to decide whether they wanted to go independent or remain with France. There you have Guinea. It has six neighbors, Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire to the even southeast, Sierra Leone as well, Mali, Senegal, and Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau is a Portuguese colony. Mali is French, Senegal is French, Africa is French. Sierra Leone and Liberia are English. Sierra Leone returned slaves from England, Liberia from America. Four main groups of, in the country. So the left side is really the coastal part where the people are, they're, they're called the, the, the Susu people. Then in the middle, where you have Mali and Senegal, Mali and Sierra Leone, this, most, but most of them are the Fulanese, right? For, so it's Senegal on top, Sierra Leone at the bottom. That middle part is occupied by Fulanese, the Futajalon area. Then the places closer to Mali are occupied by the Malinke people, of which both the president and the coup, coupists are from. And then the bottom part near Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia are forested areas with many groups. The country's first president is called Sekuturi. Sekuturi. He was a trade unionist, socialist inclination, president from 1958 to 1984, a close friend of Nkrumah, a trade unionist. In fact, when he voted, when his party won that referendum, the Washington Post reports that France left with everything. They took light bulbs, they destroyed medicine, they essentially wanted to prove to other African countries that if you vote to, for independence, we'll leave you with nothing. So Guinea is really underdeveloped. Now, there's a key photo I'm going to show you. Sekuture had two good friends in Africa. Originally, his, his best friend in, initially was Leopold Senghor of Senegal. But eventually, he would form an alliance with Kwame Nkrumah, who's in the middle, and then Modibo Keita, who sat to Nkrumah's right. And then they formed something called the Union of States of Western Africa. Remember the Ghana, Guinea, Mali Union? There are even songs about this. Ghana famously sent money to support these two countries because they, they, they believed in the cause. Both all these three men are Leninists, if you want. So they, they are socialists in inclination. They believe in nationalization of the state and all of those things, which a lot of people think do not work. So there you have Nkrumah, Sekuture, and Modibo Keita. OK, this is around 1959, 1960. Now, Sekuture would be president for at least 25 years. He won about four terms of seven years each. But he died in 1984. And if you look at Guinea's history, each time the head of state dies, there's some sort of takeover. So Lansana Conte, a soldier, took over in a military coup in 1984. And he became president in that same year and was president to 2008. That was Lansana Conte I showed you earlier. When Lansana Conte died, it was another coup d'etat led by this man, Musa Kamara. And this guy's two year reign was very bloody. Of course, all the other presidents, they were accused of repression and killings. But Musa Kamara was seriously, I mean, there was a, 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 a massive pillage and attack against citizens in 2009, leading to very ghastly scenes. Then it led to an election. In fact, somebody shot him and he was taken out of the country. Led to an election in 2010, which was won by the man who has just been overthrown. So there were not too many presidents. So this man won the 2010 election. Now, he had been... Uh, persecuted a lot by Lansana Conte. And in fact, in September 1990, in September 2001, he had to flee the country to France where he was lecturing. That was 20 years ago. 20 years down the line, he's overthrown. What did he do? Well, in 2019, 2020, when his term was about to end, he managed to change the constitution to give himself a third term. Now, this is the first properly elected Democrat in the country. A lot of people thought that his coming to power would bring human rights to Guinea. He becomes president, 2010, first five-year term, 2015, second five-year term, 2020. In 2020, when he won the election, there were massive protests. Look at the streets of Guinea. A lot of, about 12 or so people died in that protest. So quite a number of people were disappointed. He wanted a third term, manipulated the constitution to get a third term. And less than a year into his administration, he's overthrown by this man, over six foot tall, Kennel Mamadou Dumboya. 
So that's a short history. So these are the protests in 2020. Protests which he defied and still won that election by 59%. The opposition said they were it was a, they boycotted the election. Then you have Doom Boya, who's in their life from the same Malinke ethnic group as Alpha Conde. So that's a brief history of Guinea. Let me start with Ambassador DK Ose. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Ambassador. I really appreciate I really appreciate your time. Good evening. Bernard, thanks for having me. I, I had to revisit your book that you published. Chapter 11 spoke about your few years in Guinea. Yes. Um, so I, I can imagine Guinea is one of the countries close to your heart. Have you been following the developments there? What was your reaction when you heard of what happened on Sunday? You know, I haven't slept since Sunday morning. <laughs> Since Sunday morning? I haven't slept since Sunday morning. You know, I was woken up at 8.15, and I really have been following events so very closely. Mm. I, you can understand, I haven't worked in Guinea for several years, and I have friends all over the place, from both sides. And I am distraught. I'm very concerned about the future of the country, which is one of the countries I call my second uh, home. I'm concerned about what's going to happen to the people of Guinea and all my friends who are on all sides of the equation. So, Bernard, I'm very concerned about Guinea. Did this come to you as a surprise? Not really. Not really. I, I've always had a view that given the nature of the attempts made to change the constitution and the very dynamic role that the National Council for the Defense of the Constitution had played in the last two and a half years and the sacrifices which had occurred, it would not have surprised me that this would happen. And in fact, discussions have been held about this eventuality. And in two, two months ago, when I was in Conakry, I spoke to the president about the possibility of this happening. Wow, just two months ago? Yes. He obviously didn't listen to you. You know, uh, President Conde and I have been friends for a long time. He was president of what we call the FIAMF. Uh, a structure built by President Kuma to be a meeting place for radical Francophone students in Paris. And it all, he's been my friends all the time that I was a diplomat in Conakry. So I was deeply concerned. And I, we've had discussions about the future of Guinea, about democracy in West Africa, about uh, political economy of Guinea, and the utilization of Guinea's abundant natural resources for the development of countries. So we've had discussions, in fact, we've had discussions in Accra recently when he visited Accra. Mm. So how did such a, a respected um, human rights activist lecturer become almost a dictator in the sense of tampering with the constitution getting a third term, which a lot of people thought he shouldn't have had. From the readings, he appears to be, I mean, the best hope for Guinea for many years. How, is, it, is it true that he's turned around, or are we misunderstanding the man? You know, Bernard. Yeah, go ahead, I can hear you clearly. I, I'm just as surprised as many people Ah, you know, Alpha was one of the most democratic persons I'd ever known. One of the most committed Pan-Africanists that I'd met in my life. Now, in 2017, we had a long discussion about this matter. And his response was very surprising to me. One of the things he said to me was that since I never stood for the election, I could not give him a lecture about democracy. <laughs> and 
I was very surprised about his attempts at wanting a change in the constitution. And I'm not the only one who tried to speak to him about this. I mean, all his friends tried to speak to him about this. And his responses were very an alpha like So I must say that I was very surprised about the changes, and I was very surprised about the way even he ran his presidency. You know, I, last time I was there, I couldn't believe that it took me about seven different security checkpoints to be able to see to him, to be able to see him. So I asked him, look, don't you feel like you are in prison because you are not like that. He is very open, very affable, and very pro Ghana person. You know, he, he's, he used to visit Ghana all the time in the past. So I, I asked him, he said, no, 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 no. I mean, the, the duties of the president required that. It was a change that I couldn't quite understand. Mm. But I suppose that when you haven't had the kind of power that President Conte had had, you cannot understand. Mm. Is it a case of becoming a carbon copy of the man you so derided? Because Lansana Conte was, was quite fierce from what we read about him, and you were a diplomat in his time. So that maybe in, in coming into the position, maybe explain to us the fault lines in Guinea. That will probably help us. Is it just a question of ethnic issues what are the key issues which will probably transform your friend from a Democrat into this, this type of image? I think the fault lines Hello, are you there? The, yes, I'm hearing yeah, you. I'm here. Go, go ahead. The fault lines in Guinea are not totally different from the fault lines in most African countries. But in Guinea, can you hear me better? Yes, you are loud and clear. Go ahead. In Guinea, the fault line become more pronounced because of the, the quality of the natural resources that are available in Guinea and the dissolutions that the population has about uh, politicians' inability to transform the lives of the average Guinean. You know, uh, there's a French geologist who calls Guinea a geological scandal oh. because of the quality of... I mean, we talk about having bauxite in Ghana. It's a joke. We talk about having iron or gold. If you look at the quantities we're talking about in Guinea or the river bodies, etc., etc., Guinea is a very rich country. Now, the difficulty they've also had is, is embedded in the political history of the country. You know, you talk about... Secretary as a Pan-Africanist. But there were also fault lines developed there. From 58, when uh, Secretary rejected de Gaulle's call, the French reaction generated a certain reaction in the average Guinean, but also led Secretary to introduce what many would consider to be uh, uh, undemocratic tendencies. And there's a, there's a prison which was called Kambuaru, which hosted, hosted a lot of political opponents. So from that period, the traditions of opening up the political space took such a long time. You were saying that President uh, uh, Lansana Conte was very violent. I'm not sure about that. I think that I, I went in Guinea when President Lansana Conte was president, his difficulty was that when he took over the death of secretary, he promised that he would return the country to civilian rule soon. Unfortunately, he didn't live up to his promise. But in terms of uh, political suppression and denial, denial of human rights, I'm not sure that uh, he was worse than secretary or Alpha Conde. Mm. And during the period, he was one of the most open presidents you could deal with. He would drive to your house 
at 10 p.m. and sit with you and, and have dinner with you, for instance. I think his difficulty was that he didn't quite understand the major governance issues of the country. He was comfortable being president. He had the soldiers behind him. And he was just waiting till his death. So, sorry, Bernard. Yes. Right. Yeah, listen to you. Did the French, did they make a mistake in the referendum then? I mean, I mean I'm reading something and I'm told, for example, that the literacy rate is about 40 percent. Guinea has one of the highest rates of child marriage. Yes. F FGM is in the 97 percentages. Infrastructure. Yes. I mean, colleague journalists who visited the country say they literally have to stick their own water when they visit Guinea. Yes. So, and indeed, you, you wrote in your book yourself that when you were post, when, when people are posted to Guinea, some of them resign from the foreign service because there's nothing yes. there. So, yes. I mean, could, could they? Do you? Did what, did did, did Sekuture make a mistake? No, I disagree with you, Bernard. Sekuture took one of the boldest political decisions that any African president had taken then. But his ability to translate that political decision into improving the lives of the Guineans did not occur. And it's not for lack of resources. I mean, we, you know, we Ghana lend them a lot of money, but they didn't even need the resources given to them by Kwame Nkrumah. So it was not a mistake. In fact, if many of the African countries had followed suit and had run their countries well, maybe it wouldn't be where we are. You see, Zekuturi was responding to the French, and the French systematically resorted to subverting the economy of Guinea. In fact, just before the death of Zekuturi, there's evidence that the French government printed Guinean currency. And there's also evidence that uh, there were, uh, on a number of occasions, uh, mercenaries were sent to attempt to assassinate Sekuturi. In response to that, perhaps Sekuturi's uh, political responses may have been a bit harsh. Mm. Wow. Let's talk about the sub-region now briefly before I come to Doc. So, uh, as at least from August last year, there have been four coup yes. attempts. Two in yes. Mali, I think both succeeded, and then one in Niger, which failed. If you add yes. Chad, Idris Deby, we are told, was killed in war. Some people thought he was assassinated. We, don't, we are not sure. Then you have yeah. this, all from August last year till now. I mean, what is going on? Did you, did you get the question? No, uh, you, you talked about instability in West Africa. Yes. I couldn't hear the so my my question is, what is going on? <laughs> Bernard, we, have, we, should be all, we should all be very concerned. Because the indications... The indications of instability are clear all over the sub-region. And if you, you give me two minutes, let me just take you through it. In Nigeria... We haven't resolved the problem of Boko Haram. So there is a certain degree of instability. In Benin, the opposition is very angered about the manner in which uh, the last presidential elections were held, which automatically made Talon the victor because of the, 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 the new laws about who could stand elections as a presidential candidate or not. And because most of the opposition parties were denied the possibility for standing. You go to Burkina Faso, and a large portion of that territory is in the hands of extremist militants. You go to Cote d'Ivoire, and I love Cote d'Ivoire, but there is also an issue of the third term, which the opposition is contesting. And I'm not sure what's going to happen in Cote d'Ivoire. I mean, now we have Babo back, uh, Soro is in exile, and he's, they think he's plotting to overthrow the government. And in recent times, there have been extremist attacks in Cote d'Ivoire, 
You go to Guinea, you know what's happening in Guinea now. You go to Guinea Bissau, you know what's happening in Guinea Bissau now. Mm. In Senegal, you know about Khalif Fassal, the mayor who was imprisoned, and Karim Ward, and so on and so forth. So for the first time, the opposition in Senegal think that there may be a possibility of a, a, a slip in democracy in, in Senegal. You go to Mali mm. and, and Niger, which are next door, mm -hmm. and you know what's happening in both countries. So for anybody in the sub-region to think that this sub-region is very stable, we are in serious disillusionment. You cannot count beyond Cape Verde, uh, Ghana, too many of them where you can you can uh, predict the future. I didn't mention Togo intentionally because you know what's happening in Togo. Mm. So as a sub-region, the indicators of instability are very highly pronounced. And this is where I think that ECOWAS and the AU have a major role to play, to play in the area of preventive diplomacy. We know where the fault lines are. We know what can be done to prevent uh, instability occurring in a number of these countries. This is the time for the leaders of the sub-region and the continent to take initiatives of a preventive nature to improve the political situation in the sub-region. I am very concerned, and I hope that you all are. On, on that grim note, I'll take a short break. Please stay with me. This is the point of view. A uh, very sober thought coming from Ambassador Dike Ose, retired diplomat, vast experience. He has a program coming up this week. I'll tell you about that. He has a book as well. I'll tell you about When I come back, I'll speak to Dr. Abdul Jalilu Ateku, and I hope Ambassador will stay with me as well. We're trying to understand the situation in Guinea, what it means for us in West Africa. Earlier on, we spoke to Thieno Diallo, who's with the Minister of Information of Guinea. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Point of View. Tonight, we're trying to understand the situation in Guinea. We spoke to uh, an official of the Information Ministry who says this appears to be a popular coup. It's happened on Sunday. We're also speaking to Ambassador Dike Ose, a retired diplomat. He has a very interesting book called Privileged Conversations. I'll show you a copy before we end. It's a book you must get. Some of the secrets in there are just incredible. I'll be speaking to Dr. Abdul Jalil Ateku shortly. But Ambassador Ose showed us painted a very grim picture of the sub-region. He mentions Nigeria and Boko Haram, Burkina Faso and the insurgents, Cote d'Ivoire, and the ascendancy over a third, a third term. Then, of course, Guinea-Bissau. Then there's Benin. Then there's Senegal. There's Mali, Niger. He didn't even mention Gambia, where we are hearing that there, there are, I mean, all kinds of things, conversations between the former president and the current president making Poland happy and Togo. So apart from Ghana and possibly, I don't even know about Liberia and Sierra Leone, West Africa is not Kip in a good West Africa is not in a good way. Dr. Abdul Jalil Ateku is on the line. Ateka, let me just ask a couple of questions around some of his research. Doc, thanks for joining us. Um, where do I even start? I mean, let me be starting off from what Ambassador just told us about the the sub region. Can we trace all of this instability to simply dictatorship and people not wanting to leave power? Or are the problems much deeper? Right, thank you very much, uh, Bernard. Um, good evening to your viewers. And um, Ambassador uh, Osei has um, opened up the issues. And I agree with him entirely about the fact that the region is not that stable. The region is not that uh, stable. And specifically talking about um, these issues, whether it is about just the mere that people do not want to leave and all that. Yes, I think uh, uh, these are key in explaining some of these issues. The other aspect has to also do with the, 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 the failure or the inability or the failure of the uh, African Union or the international security uh, interlocutors in, 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 in the region to hold uh, governments accountable, presidents accountable, as far as 
the term limits uh, concern. And particularly, talking about the African Union, for example, I mean, the Constitutive Act, and in particular, the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, uh, proscribed the changing of term limits. And if you permit, uh, I will just read about Article 23, Clause 5. It says that any amendment or revision of the constitution or legal instruments, which is an, is an infringement on the principles of democratic change of government. But African Union ECOWAS have been silent on what we call the uh, third uh, termism, right? So, for example, if we look at uh, other uh, countries, because in, whenever we have this type of military adventurism, how the African uh, uh, Union or the ECOWAS respond to some of them, in some situations, they tend to maybe accept without invoking or taking stringent measures against those who are involved. In other situations, they, 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 they reject them. Because there are, we have uh, uh, examples of some of, some of these uh, 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 countries where the African Union, maybe where there were a number of uh, term limit um, uh, violations. For example, most recently, uh, Abdel Fattah, uh, and Sisi of Egypt, um, for example, he led the adoption of a constitutional amendment through a referendum in April 2019. And this paved the way for him to run again. Uh, look at in 2019 in Uganda Supreme Court upheld a constitutional amendment, okay, which removed the age uh, limits on the presidency, allowing uh, the aging Yoweri Museveni to expand his more than three decades reign. Right. So, and it, it goes on. If we look at even the Comoro, the same thing it happened yeah. over there. So, if other leaders look at whatever is happening because of either some kind of um, that the because the security interlocutors in the region, ECOWAS African Union, have not been able to hold them to it, then it means that others will also do that. And once there are no constitutional means of changing power, right? Because when they 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 they, they, they have constitutions and all that and they take I mean they want to continue, sometimes they take some other steps, crack down on anti uh, uh, anti government protesters and, and all that. So these are some of the reasons why you'll be having some of the uh, some of the military people also coming in. Because if you look at this particular, this Mamadi uh, 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 Dumbia and then his colleagues, so it means that they are saying that it is the government is for people. So they are doing this in the name of the people. Perhaps maybe because of the the fact that they think that once you have changed the term limit from the two to three and maybe a zero limit. So it means that there's a possibility of Alpha Conde continuing after even the third limit and all that. So once there are no, uh, maybe there are no, it, it is not clear whether they will be able to, there will be an opportunity for them to even come to power, then it could also feed into some of uh, mm. the, what we are So, so for, for those who describe what Alpha Conde did as a civilian coup, his extension of his term by one term, you can understand why they say it's a civilian coup, right? Oh, uh, cl clearly, it, it is. Because, like, what I read to you right now, the, the, the African Charter on Democracy, election and all that, proscribe, I mean, dealing with, I mean, removing some of these term limits or trying to amend the Constitution in order to prolong your rule or in order to give you that opportunity to, 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 to contest uh, elections and all that. So once you do that, it, for me, it amounts to a constitutional coup. Mm. Even though sometimes when we look, what we, have, we talk about unconstitutional means. So when the military come in, it is unconstitutional. What about those sitting presidents who amend constitution so that they will have the opportunity of ruling again? Mm. Okay. So mm. basically, so for me, I do not. I think okay. that it is it, it amount to uh, unconstitutional means of okay. of, 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 of getting. Uh, uh, some people thought the uh, chairman of ECOWAS, President Akufuado, ought to have done a bit more in 2020. I don't know whether I was the ECOWAS chair at the time, when Alpha Conde did what he did. But I think around the period, he congratulated him. The fact that he probably has the most legitimacy of all West African leaders, and the fact that he is one of the senior most, in terms of stature, West African presidents, 
do you think he's doing enough in this crazy region of <laughs> almost, I mean, insecurity, as, we've, as has been vividly described? Do you think Ghana's president is doing enough, or what, what can he do in this situation as ECOWAS chair? Well, better that has been the, the, the pattern. That has been the, the, the pattern. It is not new, all right? Because uh, they do so, look at Denis Sassou in Guizhou. And if you look at the, what, what happened in Guinea, it's as if they were just looking at, there's a playbook from President Denis Sassou in Guizhou, okay, that we have to uh, amend this. And they use so many things, some uh, interpretative uh, gymnastics, to, 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 to say that uh, the constitution states that you, should, uh, you, you, you cannot amend, but they were talking about maybe a new constitution, the way they will have a new... Uh, uh, they will have a referendum for that particular uh, constitution. So as to whether the the, 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 the ECOWAS chair has done uh, uh, enough, if you look at it, whatever has, if you look at, if you look at what happened in Guinea, and then the, 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 the history about how ECOWAS or AU respond to some of these issues, what President Kufuado has done is the same, the same thing what, what used to be in the past. Because one, it is not like if it had been like that. That's why uh, this particular uh, issue, the Guinean case, is not like maybe in the Gambia where there was a legend and then someone lost and the person decided not to seize power. So the ECOWAS decided to intervene. I mean, using uh, coercive diplomacy and also in the case of uh, 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 Cote d'Ivoire. But in Guinea, here is a, a sitting president who decided to change and. Uh, uh, to alter the constitution, that to give him the opportunity uh, to, to rule uh, uh, again. So if you look at it, the condemnation, that has been the pattern. They will condemn it. The next thing is that they will ask them to, they will ask the military officers to prepare the country towards a constitutional uh, uh, rule. Even in some instances, in some instances, like in, in Mauritania in 2005, for example, when it happened, they said, okay, they should return the country to consider rule. They condemned it and, and all that. But eventually, they even expressed their gratitude to the military rulers for returning the country to constitutional rule. So it means that other people looking, looking at the situations in their country could also use the same means in order to come to, 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 to power. So what President Kufuado did as the chair of ECOWAS has been the, 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 the pattern. All right? So it is our condemnation and then prepare the country towards uh, constitutional rule. So other than that, the point is that, and maybe they are not also being able to act properly because like from this, from the, 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 the African Charter on Democracy, it states clearly that you cannot amend your constitution, all right? So what has African Union, ECOWAS member states, what have they done? Because it, that's why I said that is their failure. It is their failure mm. to, 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 to ask government or this kind of, the, the, the uh, Alpha uh, Condes and, and, and what not, to work within the constitution. It's their failure to do that, to hold them to it. So if it happened, the question people will be asking us, so what did you do? Because they didn't do anything beyond condemnation. And that is what we are having mm. at the moment. But, but, but does the AU and ECOWAS have actually any moral authority to say anything because majority of the leaders I, I mean i can list from cameroon apart from the west african examples rwanda cameroon let's not even go into the central parts of africa where there are issues all the way down to ms in manangagua i mean look at even south africa and the struggles they are going through if you go to the northern parts as well the continent is led by men who don't want to give up power so how are they going to apply a law when one of their colleagues attempts to do what all of them have been doing? So it, and I don't even know if they have a standby force. Okay, so beyond issuing a statement, where is the deterrent power? So it seems to me as if the solution to this is not really within Africa, sadly, that it probably has to be the same foreign guys, some of who are blamed for some of these controversies, who can, can resolve this. Yeah, Bernard, you are right. That is the problem. Because when you have all these people around who are supposed to ensure the, 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 the implementation of some of these protocols and whatever uh, 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 they, they, they sign, they are also involved. And that is why some people describe uh, these organizations, the African Union, as a club of, uh, uh, of private uh, 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 
uh, organizations of protecting the, the incumbent uh, president. Some call them the club of the big, the big boys. All right. So once you are in, then they do everything because today is your turn. Tomorrow, unless in some situations where they have problems with another, like in the case of Jamin, he had friends, but at a certain point in time, he, I mean, I mean, ignored uh, his equal, equal as colleagues to the extent that Equal they even declined to send uh, election observation mission uh, in 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 in. So clearly, they had a problem with that, and uh, the, also the problem between Gambia and Senegal and all that. So. So even within a, a short period, when it happened, Senegal was ready uh, with the, their military to enter, and they even entered even before the they were they even entered before even authorization. All right. So basically, sometimes it's the relationship that exists between the leaders of these countries. They have relationship. Our mm -hmm. president has relationship with uh, Otara. He has a relationship with this president. He has it with Ford and that kind of thing. So when it happened, instead of enforcing the agreed protocols, they rather decide to engage in quiet diplomacy. All right. So in the end, mm. the problem will, will, will remain. Thank you for your insights, Dr. Abdul Jalil at Teka. This is still the point. When I come back, I'll, I'll wrap up with Ambassador Dickey or say uh, on some other things. There's a, a bigger conversation on this later in the week. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about this book as well. And whether this is as hopeless as it sounds, because frankly, <laughs> it sounds very, 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 very uh, hopeless. But we'll see how we resolve that. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Point of View. I still have Ambassador Diki Osei with me. We're reflecting on Guinea. Uh, we spoke to Thierno Diallo from the Ministry of Information. We also spoke to Dr. Abdul Jalilu Ateka. I have Ambassador Diki Osei. Ambassador, thank you for staying with us. I noticed the Council for Foreign Relations, of which you are a key uh, functionary, has a conversation. The president. The president fantastic. Has a, an event on Thursday to delve deeper into this. Um, so. what, who are these people and why should we listen to what they will be saying? They, they look like important people. You know, Dr. Kewa Manin served as the UNDC, UNDP coordinator in Conakry at a crucial time when the political reforms were taking place. And when he left, he was followed by the current UNDP rest rep in Mauritania. So these are two key people who came after me in Guinea who were involved in the democratization process and dealt with both the opposition and president, worked very closely with both Lance Anna Conte and President Alpha Conde. So they know Guinea very well. So who can benefit? Is this a high level thing for UN people or can ordinary people like myself no, no, no. also join? Everybody <laughs> can join. But, but you know, I sent you the link. <laughs> Anybody can join. And the idea is that we want to inform the public in depth about what's going on in Guinea, because this concerns us in Ghana. Should we just accept this as the decade of insecurity? I mean, I'm told the 70s, there were a lot of coups, 80s had economic challenges, 90s structural adjustment, early 2000s had these issues. So should we just accept that? Looking at the picture you painted before the break, that maybe this is just a period of no term limits, political insecurity, and we have to live with it for another 10 years. Bernard, I'm, a, uh, I'm a, uh, an optimist, hmm. and I, I hate to uh, imagine that this can continue for, for as long as uh, it's been predicted by many other people. We cannot allow the continent or our sub-region to continue this way. And there is evidence that in many, many segments, sectors, including the growth of civil society, including the improvements in education, including the awareness through uh, social media, changes are occurring which might have an impact on the evolution of the political systems internally, and then also have an impact on our relations with our neighbors. And you know, because of the, let me take Guinea as an example. 
because of what has happened in the last eight years, the next batch of political leaders will have no choice but to behave better. And let me give you the reason why. The key leaders in the National Council for the Defense of the Constitution, three of them, Selu Dalangelo, the former prime minister, uh, Siradu, uh, Sirad Jalo is a former prime minister. Uh, Lansana Kuyate is a former prime minister. So we have in the opposition people capable of running the state machinery. If only the country as a whole will respond to all the political reforms and the security secretary reforms which have been proposed, which they've all agreed on. So, Ben, and I'd rather not be pessimistic. I may sound so in just describing the status quo, but I have a lot of belief in preventive diplomacy. And I think going forward, we should engage. And we do have a lot of people who are capable and willing to help the sub-region improve beyond, or, or beyond all our expectations. I'm putting your book back on the screen because I, I think it's a good time to revisit the book. Um, any, any new material you would add now with all that's happening? I mean, your, your guinea part was incredible. The Kinshasa was a whole new story. Yes. <laughs> Is this still in print? Where can we get copies? Amazon. Amazon, I see. It's, a, it's on Amazon, but it's, it's in most bookshops in, in Accra. But... It may interest you to know that I have, I'm doing a uh, volume two, and I'm on chapter 12 now. <laughs> and, and I find the volume two even more interesting. Because in the volume one, I had to be careful. And wow. I'm sure that, yeah, but the volume two, I find much, much more interesting. But meanwhile, the, this uh, volume one, it's, it's available in most bookshops. And it's on Amazon, so anybody who's interested, can just Google and purchase it. If, and if, even if volume two is more interesting, then I can't wait because even with the, the kind of, as we say, the filler you dropped in volume, <laughs> the filler, <laughs> in, including the way you wrote the, the report on the, you know, I think you had left one of the countries to a different country with authorization. Ah, I went to Benin and yes. I came and back You, you used I... fufu and palm nut soup to get a security report. <laughs> Networking is a key tool in diplomatic practice wow yeah but you you will enjoy the volume two no and i have no doubt i can't wait but thank you for all the work you do let me remind viewers again that on thursday 9 september on zoom at 4 p.m the council for foreign relations which ambassador dike will say is the president has a big conversation on guinea in crisis with two distinguished speakers it's open to the public would we'll plug in as well we we'll learn a thing or two about our sub-region, and hopefully some of the solutions would help to bring calm to the sub-region. Ambassador, thank you for your, your time. I appreciate it. Bernard, thank you. And thank you for the great work you're doing for this country. Thank you. And we also had Dr. Abdul Jalilu Ateka, political science lecturer in University of Ghana, joining us, as well as Thieno Suleiman Diallo from the Ministry of Information. Now, we don't know which side is, whether it's on the government side or the rebel side, <laughs> but he's clearly playing. You could see he was trying to appear. He's playing his cards very well. Let's hope he, is, he stays safe in that country. We'll talk again soon. Thanks for watching. The Business That's What is next. Stay with CCTV. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. The Point of View is brought to you by Cowbell Coffee. Cowbell Coffee. Taste it. Love it. Kel Charcoal Toothpaste. Kel Charcoal. Happy Smile. Enterprise Life. Enterprise. Your Advantage.